we will move on now to an exciting presentation from Sweden's Gapminder Foundation on the costs of violence. Data, figures, statistics is important to create change, but not only that. It's also important to present and visualize data in a way that we all can understand them. And we will now learn more on the importance of investing in violence prevention from Ola Rosling, Sweden. Welcome, uh, Ola. Yes, here we have him. Welcome on stage. The Thank you. The floor is yours. We are so happy to have you here. My computer. Oh, you can hear my voice. That's great. Yeah. Here's my table and here's my computer. And uh, this is my cursor. I do a little bit of technical uh, preparation. If you want to stand up and do this, this is the moment. But don't walk away. Yes, do something like that. Yes? Because I'm going to do a high-speed presentation of uh, uh, about the world we're living in. <coughs> so you might need to do this a little bit with your shoulders. So that's fine. Everything fine with you? Vi körde HDMI rakt i. Okej. Nu, he says, nu funkar det. It means now it works in Swedish. Uh, yes. So, um, did you set the resolution of the screen? I'm afraid of having a glass of water on the on the table, but this gave me a moment for drinking water. Just so you know uh, how much I, uh, what I have skipped instead of instead of uh, being here, I could be at my daughter's school, which is five blocks that direction, because right now she had the final exhibition. Uh, of the year, of all the artwork that they have been doing. And she, but she told me, it's okay if you go because it's UNICEF. <laughs> <laughs> so I have her support and that's why I'm here. Uh, and I've got three children myself. Uh, I worked with my father and my wife for the last 18 years to set up a foundation with the sole purpose of changing how people understand the world uh, based on statistics. No political agenda, no religious agenda. It's a non-profit, an educational non-profit, which is independent. Uh, because today we have so much data about everything and hardly anyone understands it. So this is a huge problem which we're trying to solve and just innovate ways of using data without conveying a political message. Just showing the picture of where we are and what it looks like. Isn't this beautiful? Now, oh, my computer works. So now I'm going to increase the speed. D anyone recognize what this is? I know there's at least one person in the room should be able to recognize it. Anyone from Sri Lanka here? Yeah, didn't you see that? It's Sri Lanka, right? 300 uh, uh, years before Christ. Uh, that's a long time before Christ. This is the first protection of nature in human history by this fantastic, innovative king in Sri Lanka. I hardly can pronounce his name. Devanapi. Okay, I give up. I don't have time. But this, the uh, idea of protecting was, uh, came out of love for the beauty of nature, of course, and the fact that, that we have to protect it because if we let the power of man destroy everything, we will end up with a mess, right? That was a great innovation, and now in Stockholm, here where I live, I'd say 99% of everyone I know love this idea of protecting nature. So values can spread. It takes a long time. It took 2,000 years for a European to come up with the same brilliant idea in Yorkshire, in UK. And then we got these Grand Canyon, Yellowstone in US, etc. It takes some time for European to catch up. But uh, it can happen. Today we got the United Nations organization committed to actually monitor how much of nature is protected. In 1900, more than 100 years ago, it was only 0.03% of the global planet that was protected nature. And this is how it has changed during the last 100 years. 15% of nature today is protected from zero back then, right? 
we can definitely change, and this is through a, a change of values that has become global. And you can see how it still ticks up, and the question is only, are we going to protect 100% of the nature? Is that actually where we end, or should we have some agricultural land left? That's a tricky question, but we can do this definitely, and it's happening. In 1944, this, th you, you recognize this man, right? They saved your life. How did you travel here? You, t you took an airplane. How many took an airplane? Oh, you're lying. The rest of you are just lying. Most of you took an airplane. <laughs> These guys saved your life because in 1944 they sat down in Chicago at the convention in their, in their boring suits and they, they say, okay, every crash report from every airplane accident needs to be reported so that we share knowledge of what works in terms of airplane safety. And they had an Annex 13 to the Chicago Convention, which was used last week in Russia when this terrible airplane accident is still in use. It is the method that has saved all the lives. Back then, in 1929, they experienced 2,000 deaths per 10 billion passenger miles. A terrible rate of death, which is unacceptable to passenger air flight. So they realized to make this a consumer market, we need to make it safer. And did they? It's more safe to fly with an airplane than walking in stairs today, thanks to this Annex 13. Every accident has been reported and shared globally. And every problem that was identified has been removed. So it's almost too safe to fly, I would say. It's not a thrill any longer. Okay? So we can definitely change the world. Here are 16 other things. I don't have time to talk about them. Terrible things that has been decreasing during the last 100 or 30 years. From HIV, smallpox, ozone depletion, the lead in gas, you know? Back when I was a child, everybody talked about lead in gas. Now it's banned in all countries except three during my life. A complete global consensus evolved from these. And then there are 16 things that are just improving also. These things we never hear about in the mass media. So people walk around thinking the world is getting worse. And that's why we started our foundation. Together with my, my father, uh, we identified that the, the misconception that the world is getting worse is making people misbelieve and lose their hope for the future, which is a major problem when we actually know what to do, right? The ozone hole looked like this 17 years ago, today it looks like this. Because the ozone depletion gases, we have stopped to consume them. Because we agreed in Montreal to stop. That's how humans change the world, and that's what we're doing here today, right? This works. It's just a slow process, you have to monitor it. Don't look at the news, look at the statistics. That's how you do it. Then there's lots of progress. Here are all the other global consensus agreements around the environment. They were signed between 1970 and today uh, by more than 150 countries. It's na natural protection has a lot of these. Let me show you how the world changed in another way. 200 years ago, the world looked like this. These are, every bubble is a country, okay? The size of the country is the population. So China and India are the big ones. This was 200 years ago in 1800. Uh, on this axis, we have child mortality rate. Rough historical estimates. On this axis, money. So this is rich and poor, and back then, everybody was poor. Had a very low GDP per capita. But over the 200 years, look at this tremendous change. Remember, please remember, that they were up on a child mortality rate where almost half of the children died before age five. That was 200 years ago. That was the norm on this planet. You lose every second child everywhere. Doesn't matter if you're the king in Sweden, right? Because they didn't know to wash hands and stuff like that, okay? But this has changed. Human knowledge has spread across the world. Look how every country has dropped tremendously over the last 200 years. There is no country left up on that level. And all the countries are in constant change, slowly, year by year, ticking downwards. There is not a single country up here. Today, all countries are below the healthiest country back then. So we should clap our hands for humanity, I think. Yes? That's a great chance. So we can change this place. There is no doubt about that. If someone doubts, it's just an emotional, psychological bias or something that they can read books about, right? There's no reason to doubt we can change. But when we ask people, is the world getting better or worse? These are the poll results from YouGov. And look in Sweden, where I live. 10% of the people around me when I walk the streets and when politicians talk to the audience, 10% think the world is getting better. The others are so annoyed, everything is getting worse. 
this is a huge psychological illusion. Okay, we have to get rid of it, and that's why we do education about these things. Of course, there are problems. We shouldn't be black and white and say everything is getting... No, not everything is getting wet. There are more weapons on our street. There is more obesity. There are tons of problems. But in general, you have to keep things apart. Some things are better, some are worse. So we fight devastating ignorance with a fact-based worldview that everyone can understand. That's the mission of this foundation, and we're absolutely independent innovators. I'm not here to promote our foundation, because what I really care about is the development of the world. This is my father, Hans Rosling. <laughs> he I'm just carrying the legacy, and I hope you to join us. All our tools are freely available, and I'd love to put in the data about violence against children as soon as there is better data. I'll come to that soon, okay? Uh, this, for example, is a change that follow all the others. The babies per woman. I myself have three. To take care of them well, it's, it's of course, would be cha more challenging if I had six, like uh, mothers used to have back in the 1800s. Uh, up till 1965, uh, it used to be very, very high, but then the sexual revolution changed across the globe. People started talking about reproduction and separating it from sex. They say, okay, re reproducing is one thing, but with contraceptives we can separate it. This has happened across all human cultures and religions. There is nowhere the, uh, the culture is not capable of this change. So now we are changing the number for our species in terms of average number of children, right? Across the, the regions, Europe dropped first, then came Americas with a baby boom after the World War. And then Asia came and it dropped super fast. And it was not thanks to Mao. It was because mothers wanted to have fewer children when they didn't need labor on their fields and, and any longer. And now the same change is happening in Africa if we just continue with the family planning program. And I, I don't hear fertility rate mentioned here, but I can imagine it's easier to be a good parent if you have fewer children. And that's definitely going to be easier in the future because this is where we're moving. This means that the number of children in the world has stopped increasing. Almost nobody knows this. There are two billion children and the UN Population Division estimate that it will continue like that. There won't be more children. It's the number of adults that increase. I don't have time to explain why, but it's the population pyramid looks like this, and then it looks like that, without increasing the, the foundation, whatever. When one billion of these children are being beaten by their parents, rough, rough, rough estimate. This is why we're here today, because it is damaging to the world, because this is the world, this is the future of the world. Now, let's go and look at violence against children. This is from a recent study in Sweden. I don't think Swedish children are very different from anyone else. Uh, psychosomatic disorders reported last year in Sweden. You ask teenagers if they were beaten at home, and then what of these problems do they experience during the last month? You see that all these psychosomatic disorders are higher among the children. It's almost a double amount of stress and sleep problem headaches if you were beaten at home in Sweden last year, okay? We have anecdotal studies like this, but do we have global data? No, that's the problem. I will come to that later. Suicide attempts by children who were not beaten and those who were beaten. We don't need this in the world. We, we should definitely fight this because it will live with you the rest of your life if you got beaten at home. There is no doubt about the problem. And this is, is the, the report that Shiv can talk more about later that is the best compilation of this kind of data. Pulling that data together is very challenging. When we monitor the ozone layer or the lead in the gasoline, we need data to see if we're making progress. The first one who attempt to pull all the data together will probably make a lot of mistakes. And all the italic numbers here are actually estimates from the regional averages. So they are almost useful, useless. Some of them are useless and some are useful. And next time we meet here in two years, I'd like the numbers to be even better in the next report. That's what we need. Because today I cannot show you animating bubbles with violence against children because there is no data, you know? So I can't show you the beautiful development that probably has happened, at least in some places. That's what we need to also convey this to the public, how the world is changing in this aspect. I can only show you this chart, which actually has uh, Shiv's data on the, the y-axis showing percent corporal punishment, rough estimates for rough half of the countries, no real data, rather, estimates on, on uh, local data. But where there is real data, it's the UNICEF and UN data, right? Uh, and on this axis, I have money, because I always put money. There is kind of a line, you see, but it's not very strong. Very rich countries like this can also have high corporate punishment, and you see this huge difference on the same GDP per capita level. 
Some are down on, on 50 or below, on the same level where others have corporal punishment on 9. So there is no clear evidence that with more GDP per capita, it will just drop. No, this is about education and culture. It's a different thing, right? So let's separate it. Though the benefit or the cost for the society is all about money. That's not about culture. Because these uh, disabled children walk through life and they cost a lot. Not only do they suffer themselves. So there are three studies that I could find through this UNICEF contacts that have tried to estimate the co cost of the burden economically. I UNICEF Asia Pacific office did an estimate. I extrapolated it to the world just based on their percentage. They think 1.3 trillion, that's the equivalent, 2% of GDP in that region is what the total cost of direct medical care, it's a small thing. It's more the indirect psychological and the long-term cost of, of helping all these children when they grow up. Here's another estimate from ODI Overseas Development Institute. Child Fund Alliance together estimated to be 8%. There is always the danger when you love a cause like saving children. You want these numbers to be as high as possible, right? Yeah, of course, you put in every, th every cost you can imagine. So that's why I wanted multiple estimates. I think most of these are probably... Copenhagen consensus has, uh, is not driven by that kind of feeling. Do you know what it is? It's Bjorn Lomborg, a strict economist. He just want to see where do you get most uh, bang for the bucks? Should I invest in this or that? So that number I actually trust a lot because it's not calculated from the heart, I know. 4%. All of these numbers are pretty high. Rough, let's say 3% then. We round downwards, right? So nobody can come later and tell us that, oh, it was an exaggeration, because that's dangerous. Then it bites back at us, right? So roughly 3%. When you look at the IMF report for global economic development, they estimate that we will have 3.7 GDP growth the next year. That's the equivalent number, right? The GDP, it's, it's almost the total GDP growth that we're expecting in a year that is lost from all the costs from these dysfunctional citizens, which are also suffering. So I'll just close the part about the costs there, because this seems to be the best estimates. I'll just say we don't need better number than, than this. It's w among the highest bang for the bucks in the Copenhagen consensus list, and they are re he's, v he's hated by the environmentalists because their investments are never worth it, you know? But <laughs> so that's a different discussion in a different forum. But th that strict uh, calculation is definitely telling us that, yes, it's also worth it, definitely. Uh, not doing it is like just sawing that, it's just plain stupidity. Like with washing hands. Did anyone wash their hands this morning? Please raise your hand. I don't want to see any hands down. <laughs> uh, no, all of you. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Did you not wash your hands? I, I spotted you. I'll talk to you later. Do you know why you wash your hands? Because it's worth the money, right? That's why. No, it's disgusting not to wash hands, right? Because you learned in school what, what these germs actually look like. They are so small. You can't see them unless you know that. It's knowledge, right? That's why we wash our hands and brush our teeth. We know it's good. It's good later, much, much later. It's good for the society, and it's very cheap. So the WHO have, uh, they met around these kind of things, like malaria prevention back in 1947, saying we need anti-malarias, and then they monitor the progress. This is how we do it across the field. I'm just saying that it's time to do this for, uh, for violence against children. This is for washing your hands. They have nice logotypes. When they know what is the right thing to do, they put nice fancy little icons so that general people come there and click and learn about. Uh, um, the, the soap, though, they didn't invent it. It is 2,000 years old from Babylon. It took humanity 2,000 years to realize they should use the soap. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, because they thought that diseases came through air and mystic spirits and stuff like that. So it takes some time to, to create knowledge, and the moment you realize it, you saw how child mortality dropped. It's mainly caused by soap, vaccines, and mother's education. Pretty cheap things, right? So y if you know what to do, uh, you can change it, and you put some nice logotypes on the World Health Organization website so everybody understands what to do. And now they did this last year. And that is the INSPIRE uh, framework. Seven strategies for ending violence against children with nice logotypes. Look at this. Really nice colors as well. Easy. You do this and you, you get a change in your society. The most impressive thing is not that it's seven, you know. It's, the, it's even more organizations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten 
that's unique, right? In global collaboration, that 10 organizations unite between the same cause instead of saying, we are better than you, save the children. No, UNICEF, give the money to us. No, they just united behind this because it's so ridiculously bad how it's been treated. We're not monitoring this and people don't realize the cost. I say that's, that's elegant. Let's look at the seven. Is it just mumbo jumbo? No, I'd say I had a quick course. I'm not an expert in this. I'm an expert in teaching the world is getting better in many ways. But learning this was true, truly simple, right? What are these seven? These photos that you see out there are examples of real life, what it looks like. Here is a law against violence in family and you can report it at the gender desk, right? That's what it looks like. That's what you need to do. It's nothing, it's not academic theory, right? It's a desk, right? And a police with a salary. It's very, very concrete. That's what WHO, that's why I made their logotype blue and big. Because if WHO puts something up, it's because they're going to measure it and they know it works. I rarely see anything which is just policy on World Health Organization's website. It's the real stuff. Okay? Sorry, UNICEF. I didn't mean, no offense there. Okay? <laughs> Norms and values. I go to church and I learn from my moral leader not to be children. Great. Any problem understanding what it is? No. No whatsoever. It, the values change in a society. This is US. Uh, is it okay to spank a child? Over time, since 1986, you see how the agreeing is decreasing in US. Values change slowly. And then suddenly something happens and the norm changes. But definitely these, we have to monitor these as well. The attitudes, right? Safe environments, like in West Java here, a school where children are happy, right? A very good place for the future. Economic incentives strengthening. St these these uh, girls were, were beaten by their stepfather. They ran away from home, ended up trafficking. And then they have this safe haven to go in Tanzania. It's very, very understandable, and it's definitely worth it. These girls are going to be strong coming out of this community, and they become new leaders, and they know this society took care of me. I will give back to the society. That's what we need, loving societies that care. That's what you invest in, and that spreads because the people around them see a victim that was actually cared for by the society. That's, that's probably the hardest to capture. Is this correlated to money? Is money important? This is UNICEF data from Mix and DHS survey. To the left, the poorest quintile uh, percentage of violent discipline. To the right, the richest quintile. So the poorest 20%, the richest 20%, and the lines go like this, you see? There is kind of a tendency to fall with more money within countries, but no, it's not very strong. In many countries, you see the opposite. Richer people uh, beat their kids more, okay? So don't think that the richer they get, they will, they will stop beating their children. No, that's not how it works. It's strange. I actually thought I, I would see a correlation. With fertility rate, you see a very clear correlation. More money, more education, less children. Almost everywhere, right? But not with the, with the beating of children. What is this? Well, this is a 15-year-old girl, and her mother gave birth to her first child when she was 12. A family which get children very, very early, obviously. Society comes in and helps them. If there is violence in that family, the nurse or social worker will discover it. It's very concrete. I have no problem understanding what these seven are. That's my message to you, right? This is yes, so concrete, it's almost ridiculous. You just have to build this institution and educate these people and put them in place in the local community. Don't do any mumbo-jumbo on top of that. It's just, it's just the real world, right? You need to have a... a a uh, spirit in a classroom with children and parents saying, you know, it's cu be curious about your child. It's such a strange thing, a child, right? They, they behave strangely, but learning to understand there is an emotional development going in and starting to play with it, that's a pretty new thing in human culture, that we have cognitive psychology realizing how we actually develop our worldview and our identity and our ideas. So teaching that to parents and children are inspiring. It is inspiring. And then, of course, this investment, I say, is the only one. If you look at the other ones, it's they have positive, positive unintended side effects. Like, you invest in this uh, electricity in a safe place so there is a lamp. Well, you have to bring electricity to the whole community, so you can do it at the same time, right? And there is tons of positive side effects of having electricity. Kids can study in the evening and so on. But this one is probably the one that is targeted at this very problem. In Tanzania, at this, the, the lead female detective is 
actually a woman and you have made sure that you have that program and, and that it's done in a way so that you can, you can so she feels safe reporting. Uh, that whole institution is, of course, not spilling immediately over to the rest of the society. No. But all the others, I would say, all the six others, like reduce the consumption of alcohol. Yeah, do that. That's a great idea to do, actually. It will spill over to the rest of the society. Then you can use the violence against children as an argument that that's why we're limiting the consumption of alcohol. Everybody or most people would agree, oh, good idea. And then you get all the side effects, which they wouldn't agree with, right? So I, I think that's, but this one is really about the violence itself. So just finishing, now wrapping up my last slide, what is it that you need when you have a problem? Well, you need to understand the size of the problem. Let's say one billion, roughly, that's, uh, that's the estimate. Uh, half of all children are probably experienced this. And remember how high the stress levels were among those who were beaten in Sweden. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about many, many children suffering. The cost are uh, roughly 3%, like the GDP growth on Earth. Rough, rough estimate. I see no reason not to solve it. Well, you could avoid solving it if you don't know what to do. You have a big problem and you don't know what to do. Like with clim climate change, it's pretty tricky, right? We don't know exactly what will work. Ah, fortunately, in this case, we know what works because a big UN organization put their blue logotype there. They've tested this. It's based on evidence. This works. It's worth it. So these seven things are not just mumbo-jumbo. And now the question is where we're not done, which always happens when you start solving a problem seriously. Monitoring progress. I would say what we have done is creating the, the first uh, attempt to put together all the data. And there are tons of gaps and problems with these estimates. And I'd say that is the main challenge for the next meeting, to be able to actually monitor levels and then even progress. There is a missing estimation and, and common framework for making it internationally comparable. And I think it's a major culture and translation issue here. Having children reporting in Sweden, whether they were beaten at home or not, is probably doable because they trust the government not to to uh, go to their parents and tell them they told, etc. All these trust chains are probably different in different cultures. So, of course, there you need serious academic research to develop the methodology correctly, but you invest in that once, and you know this is the way to actually do the interviews, etc. The sample size you need is like in Sweden, only the roughly 1,000, 2,000 children, or a bit more if you want to drill down on subdivisions. But you don't have to ask every child. That's very expensive. But do a real good random sample size. It shouldn't be so uh, expensive to invest in that. So that's definitely a good way to know that the way it's implemented, the Inspire, is also working on a country level. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's just here. Thank you, Mr. Rosling. But I would like to say I love you, Ula, and I also love the way you present your facts and you rock. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. <laughs> Moving on to some more facts and figures, uh, I would now like to welcome on stage Mr. Shiv Kumar, Global Kosher, No Violence, Development Economist and... Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and Professor, very welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much. That was an absolutely scintillating uh, presentation by Ola. Thank you so much, and also for doing the plug for our report, No Violence in Childhood. Um, I'll make very brief comments, and of course, if you want details of what I have to say, you'll read the full report. But let me pick up from the last slide that Ola put up on problem, cost, solution, and monitoring. As far as the problem, which is the scale of the problem, is concerned, we have heard this many times before, that the, any estimate of the number of children abused is going to be an underestimate uh, because of the culture of silence that was talked about this morning surrounding reporting on violence. Many children are very small to report or very scared to report. And many countries don't have mechanisms for children to report with confidence and in privacy. But as an economist, I can also tell you that when it comes to estimating costs of violence. I think uh, Ola put up this uh, rough figure of about 3%, but it was ranging from 2 to 8%. Uh, you must recognize that these are extraordinarily underestimated costs of violence. Uh, in fact, even more so, I would argue, than, than the estimates on the actual prevalence rates of numbers. And I'll tell you why. Because as economists, whenever you ask me to estimate a cost, first I have to identify something. 
I have to quantify it, and I have to put a monetary value on the quantity. And that's how, whether it's environmental economics or any subject, we do it. So what happens is that, first of all, only some, only some impacts are known, and these are often the direct impacts of, or immediate direct impacts of violence. Uh, much less is known about lifelong impacts, and even very little is known about intergenerational impacts. So we are really not in a situation to capture the full impact. Second, only some of the impacts can be quantified. Now, Ola put up this thing about psychosomatic problems. Now, how do you quantify psychosomatic problems? So a large number of problems are really left out of the costing exercise. And thirdly, when it comes to putting uh, monetary value, there are lots of ethical questions on uh, what is the value of a headache uh, of a child or whatever, mental trauma of a child in India versus mental trauma of a child in Sweden. Uh, is, should it be treated equally or differentially? Should we use per capita income? There are lots of ethical questions on monetization. But even if you go with that, uh, we fee find that only some can be assigned a monetary value. And that would be, so a large part of mental health and trauma and psychosomatic disorders are completely out of the calculation. So any number you see. So if you were shocked with 3%, 4%, believe me, the real number is much, much more. Second, uh, I also want to say as an economist that uh, costs should not be used as justification for prioritizing one form of violence over another. And I think this is extremely important for us to keep in mind because, like I said, many forms of violence cannot simply be quantified and assigned a monetary value. So you would really miss that. Second, that some forms of violence are less difficult. I deliberately use the word less difficult and not easy, because all is very difficult, are less difficult to assign a monetary value than others. So if you prioritize on the basis of costs, you give an unfair weightage to those that we can really identify, quantify, and assign a marriage, and many significant forms of violence may fall off the radar. And third, I want to say that there is a sense that if it's a very high cost, uh, then it must be very severe, and that must get prioritized. And that is completely, psychologists, uh, child psychologists will tell you that is not the way to look at violence against children and the impact on children. What you might think is a low-cost spank on the child affects different children differently. What is, the, what is the psychological makeup of the child? What is the environment in which the child is growing up? And so we cannot really say that spanking, and which may become repeated spanking, and might just become very traumatic for some children, and may not become so traumatic for some children. So anyway, the plea I'm making is that cost should not be used to prioritize, and we should not have a hierarchy of prioritization of what to attack first based on cost. Despite these caveats, then I would still ma make the plea that we must look at costs and cost effectiveness very carefully. And for three very simple and obvious reasons. First, resources are scarce, particularly in developing countries. And so finance ministers are really keen and policymakers are keen and so should we on ensuring that we use our resources most efficiently and equitably. So we must focus on costs and cost effectiveness. Second, if you focus on cost effectiveness, then something will become very obvious. And that obvious thing is that prevention is the way to go. Because across our interventions in, in public health and other fields, only if you invest in prevention, you are able to save huge costs in avoiding treatment and cure. So it's quite a no-brainer that you have to invest in prevention. And I think any kind of economic analysis that we can do will ensure that. And third, I think we have to ensure that with a small amount of investment in, cost, uh, in preventing violence, the returns on existing investments in health, education, et cetera, will go up. So do I have the red light? Or you have two minutes? Oh, it's, it's red. But uh, okay, please, just, just, just last please, two uh, minutes. Conclude. <laughs> the last two comments, I'd make it very brief. Uh, while many countries have taken steps to collect better data on prevalence of uh, violence, much less effort has gone into estimating costs and doing some thorough economic analysis. I mean, it is quite sad if you saw uh, Ola was able to present only three studies, three studies estimating what the costs are, however crude they may be. So there is really a need, and as was presented in the previous session also, that we must all do much more intensive and systematic economic analysis. And the last point I want to make is that while 
we must understand costs and cost effectiveness. We should not forget, we should not forget that all acts of violence, regardless of costs, are a violation of child rights. So it is in the ultimate analysis, ending violence is not a matter of costs. It is a matter of child rights, it is a matter of childhood security, it's a matter of children's dignity. And I think child rights, childhood security, and children's dignity is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Shiv Kumar, and thank you to Ulla Riusling for enlightening us. Now, <coughs> we move into session seven, which is the last session of the day. And our final speakers for the day will now speak to the three strategies